The following video was produced by World of Tanks, a game which involves, oddly enough, tanks. Plus other armoured vehicles with which you can enjoy driving around in and blowing up other vehicles. If you wish to give it a try and associate it with this video, go to worldoftanks.com slash chieftain. Greetings all! We are making a little bit of a detour here. As you may know, this vehicle is not in World of Tanks, and to the best of my knowledge, it is not planned to be either. So why, you may ask, is World of Tanks looking at a half-track? Well, it's because this vehicle represents a important and rather underrated part of US armored vehicle history. It's one of the first batches of tank destroyers, and it set the stage for all the TDs which followed. Okay, so a quick recap for the three of you who haven't been paying attention to this story so far. 1939, the condition of US anti-tank defenses was dire. It was to the point that they were doing experiments of chucking rifles and stones into tracks in the hopes of disabling tanks. Come 1940, though, with the rapid and sudden fall of Poland and France, combined with the German propaganda newsreels of Panzers careening across the countryside, this put a new emphasis on the question of how do you stop a massed tank attack? Because obviously the more traditional method of sprinkling the front line with anti-tank guns wasn't cutting the mustard. The solution which it came up with was the tank destroyer force. As originally envisioned by McNair, this would be a group of highly mobile, rapidly moving towed anti-tank guns. But actually the towed thing wasn't so much of a requirement, and the tank destroyer force actually ended up choosing self-propelled mounts. Initial self-propelled mounts mainly focused around wheeled configurations of 37mm guns, although there was an attempt to put a 3-inch gun onto a Klee track, the gun motor carriage T1, later M5, which was a complete waste of time and wasn't going anywhere fast. Also, it was starting to be concluded that perhaps the 37mm gun was not powerful enough for the job. An expedient tank destroyer was required. The solution, proposed in June 1941, was to take some old 75mm guns and mount them onto M3 half-tracks. This became the T12, which eventually developed into the 75mm gun motor carriage M3, and as such formed the heavy platoons of the tank destroyer companies with which the US Army entered ground combat in North Africa. We are at the Museum of the American GI in College Station, Texas, so standing in front of one of, to my knowledge, three extant M3s, this one is painted up as Tar Heel, which was an M3 which saw service in Iwo Jima. The Marines used them a little bit longer than the Army, the Army's ones being replaced in the tank destroyer role, but the Marines kept them around a little bit as assault guns. Now if you think of a half-track as a, an M3 scout car with a long rear end, you won't be far off. Pretty much all the half-tracks had a body with oval head screws with self-locking nuts attached to a frame one quarter inch thick everywhere except for the windshield visors. The radiator has a closable louver. On the front of all the M3s you're going to see an unditching roller and the purpose behind this is if you go into a ditch a little bit too steep, instead of the pointy nose digging into the ground, the unditching roller in theory would allow you to press against the far side and roll up a lesson the M114 designers probably should have learned. As you move a little bit further over to the side, you're gonna come across some tow hooks. Coming onto the pressed steel fenders with headlights behind brush guards, you have 20 by seven wheels. They're on leaf springs with dual action shock absorbers. Then you come to the classic accordion type hood under which you will find the prime mover what most people will call the engine. What we have here is a white 160AX. It's a six cylinder inline, 386 cubic inches, pumps out 147 horsepower when it red lines at 3000 RPM. All told, this will haul the 10 ton vehicle along at up to 45 miles an hour. Radiator system, six gallons of coolant. But it's a very simple system. I mean, long before the days of electronic controls, if you understand the basics of the internal combustion engine, this can be maintained with simple tools.
So as you get to the back of the vehicle, it starts to look a bit more like a tank. Really, you're better off thinking of it just as a truck in which the rear wheel has been stretched out. There's no fancy steering systems like there is on a German half track. Instead, what you have is the power is transmitted through the sprocket wheel at the front with the single row of teeth, which intermeshes with the metal center guides. Comes over a single bogey per side, each of which has two pairs of road wheels on each side of the center line of the bogey with the return roller up top, and they are mounted on the vertical volume suspension springs as ever popular with the US Army at the time. And at the back, of course, you have your idler wheel through which tension may be applied. Now, because you can't break track, the way you get this endless rubber track off is you jack up the body, you then take a chain, which comes over the top here and it lifts the bogey wheels off the ground. You remove the flange of the idler wheel, and the idler wheel is not two identical halves bolted together. It's, it's closer, you think about it, as a tank sprocket wheel with just this outside ring bolted in place. So that comes off, and then you can pry off the track with pry bars. And you pry on the new track with pry bars, put the flange back on, tension the track, lower the bogies, and drop the jack. You're done. So I figured the best way to show you just how similar this is to a truck is to come underneath and show you the gubbins. So if you start at the front with the engine, then you get the transmission, comes back past the clutch to the transfer case and you can see where the power shaft goes to the front axle. This disc back here, that's your parking brake, comes through the universal joint into a standard truck differential. You can see it's on a beam chassis with all the usual fuel and brake pipes, the exhaust pipe, there's really nothing in here that you won't see underneath a typical truck at the time. Coming around the back, well, it is a converted armored personnel carrier in effect, and it comes with the APC's door. It's a little hard to get into because they've basically raised the floor to make room for all the ammunition stowage. But I guess you can always stand on the pintle to get in. Other than that, stowage boxes left and right. You have a little electrical port here if you're towing a trailer, brake lights, a bucket, and these rather quaint and characterizing canvas mud flaps. On the right hand side of the vehicle there's really nothing that isn't on the left hand side except for the exhaust pipe and the battery box on the assistant driver's running board. They of course did some pretty major reconfiguring of the inside of the vehicle. For starters the two 30 gallon fuel tanks have been moved from their earlier location for the Ford to the back corners. Initially the M3 was going to have a crew of four but they required five after a bit of testing. So what they did was they added a fold down seat, which actually attaches to the back door. So you have to close the back door and then they can fold down the seat that rests on the ammunition compartments. Originally, there was going to be a caliber 50 pintle mount located here, but they realized that it just took up room that was required for the ammunition compartments, which are hinged and simply open up easily enough. The lack of an uh, anti-aircraft mount wasn't really much of a problem though because in early tank destroyer organization they had organic anti-air vehicles as part of the TD units. And so we come to the fun bit, the gun. It's the model 1897A4. Yes, it is basically the French 75, after which the drink was named. And it is in effect a 19th century weapon. Yes, the tank destroyers went into battle with an older version of the guns that were found on tanks. Now, you'll see a lot of people say, oh, the 75 was chosen because it was better at killing infantry than it was at killing tanks, which is complete rubbish. This was basically the best gun that the US could reasonably field on a vehicle at the time. It was good at killing infantry, yes, but it was also pretty good at killing tanks. Ammunition to be fired would have been AP, APC, or HE. You could lob the HE rounds, 13,800 yards, but the meathead loadout would probably be in the AP rounds. 59 rounds in total would be carried, of which 19 are under the mount and an additional 40 at the back of the vehicle. The M61 AP round would penetrate about 58 millimeters of armor at 30 degrees at 1,000 yards, and the M72 61 millimeters at the same range, although the difference was 10 millimeters at 500 yards because the round lost momentum a little bit more quickly. 
There is one small difference between an M3 and an M3A1 go motor carriage, and that is the mount. Originally, the more modern M2A3 mounts were used, such as on this vehicle, but eventually they started to run out and had to use older M2A2s. And the way you tell the difference is that the mount is about three inches further back and is closer to flush with the back end of the ammunition case. The difference in practice was that you had three degrees less depression with the more rearward mount. It goes down to seven instead of ten. On the other hand, you did get two additional degrees of left traverse. So this gun would traverse 19 degrees left, 21 to the right, but on an M3A1 gun motor carriage, you'd have 21 degrees each direction. To aim, the gunner, who I have to say doesn't really have a comfortable firing position, he's got to kind of kneel, has a telescope M33. It has a kind of a grid sight, which is reticled for range up to 1600 yards and also has mills for estimating range and adding lead. Traverse and elevation are by the two simple control handles. Elevation is a little bit counterintuitive. You rotate forward in what would ordinarily be a down to elevate and of course reverse it to depress. Traverse, however, is also backwards. So you rotate counterclockwise to traverse right and clockwise to traverse left. Something else you're not going to see in this vehicle is an electrical firing trigger. Because remember, this gun is a pre-World War I design. It's a pre-20th century design. Now, this particular gun was manufactured in 1918 in France and was then brought back to the US after the Great War. It's not really conducive to a solenoid mount. So what has to happen is, as the gunner is aiming, and he's kind of sitting sideways as near as I can gather, it's going to be a great way of doing this, and he lines up on the target, he's got to yell fire, and then the cannoneer will send the round down range. Over on the cannoneer's side, some people might call it the loader, but apparently in the US Army, World War II, they were called cannoneers, don't ask me why. He has another elevating handle on the right hand side of the mount to help out the gunner. The tool chest is down by his feet, and of course he will open and close the breech and send the round down range to do so. Push button. Rotate the breech up, insert your round, close the breech, and the firing pin, which is behind the hammer here, which you see is spring loaded. To send around down range, you simply pull back the hammer and then let go. There is a safety, it physically blocks the hammer. It is right now on root. If you set it to tear, which is of course French for fire, when I let go of the hammer, It'll hit the firing pin and would then detonate the primer. So, gunner yells, fire, loader, let's go. That's it. Gun recoils, then open. Very old school. Now, after a while, there was a, basically the run out of 75mm M1897s, and there was thought about putting the 75mm M3 from the tank into the gun motor carriage. Now this had a horizontally sliding breech block, semi-automatic operation, as you would expect. However, by this point, the M3 was getting a little bit long in the tooth and it was deemed not worth the effort to make the conversions. The gun shield, well, there are several different designs trial, but the one that they ended up with was this with 0.625 of an inch of armor up front, so up to 12 degrees. And as you can see, it traverses with the mount. Coming around to the assistant driver's position. Simple as. I do note that they have a lube order in the door. One of those things you want to consult frequently. Now, other things you'll see when you come in here, there is a control lever here for the radiator shroud. Again, you, I find on most half tracks and scout cars. Builder's plate, 75 millimeter gun motor carriage M3. Behind the canvas, you'll find the radio. The assistant driver's job in combat was to find the radio, as you would expect. Now, of course, you have a 75mm gun and not much between you and the muzzle blast. So what has to happen, according to the manual, is you crouch. And presumably cover your one ear while the other ear 
has the radio speaker. Now this particular vehicle has a Navy radio because that's what the Marine Corps M3s use. Of course, Army vehicles would have an Army radio instead. Finally, spare parts or tools can be found underneath the seat, which folds forward and then up. And so the final position, the driver's position. As with a lot of the other half tracks and scout cars, you're going to find a fuel tank selector switch is located behind the driver's seat. And the driver, of course, has to be careful not to thwap his head on the cross beam as he gets in. So now that I'm in, I'm immediately appreciative of the fact that unlike pretty much every other scout car or half track I've driven, in fact, unlike every other scout car or half track I've driven, there is no crossbar at the top where the windshield would go, which gets in my way because ordinarily I sit like this and you cannot see my eyes, which means that I cannot see the road. However, on the M3 gun motor carriage, because the 75 millimeter has a little bit of a blast, and will probably shatter any glass that is in a windshield. Instead, what they've done is simply remove the windshield entirely and the associated crossbar and replaced it by a forward and down folding half inch thick piece of armor plate on a hinge with a little notch in there for the carriage to be cleared. Other than that, we're looking at pretty much a standard internal for a scout car or half track. So as you're going over the instrument panel, well, you have a compass, magnetic compass on the front left here, which has to be, of course, calibrated to account for all the metal. Tachometer, do not operate over 2000 RPM until cooling temperature has reached 160 degrees Fahrenheit. A very nice little guide here for all the levers. There are four levers on the right hand side. Nearest one is a transmission. It's a four speed with neutral and it is not a synchronized gearbox. So guess what? If you don't know what double D clutching is, you probably shouldn't be driving one of these vehicles. And enough Americans have trouble with stick shifts, let alone double declutching. In order to make room for the radio box, the handle on this vehicle has had to be bent. Next one in is the handbrake. Forward is off, back is on. Transfer case, low range or high range. And I assure you in low range first gear, this thing crawls with godly amounts of traction. And finally, you can engage or disengage the front axle. You push it forward, it's engaged. You push it back, it's disengaged. In almost mo pretty much all circumstances, you don't need the front axle. It's only if you've really gotten yourself into trouble that you put it into front axle engaged. You combine that with low range first gear and there's almost nothing you're not gonna get out of. Move back to the dash, panel lights, external lights are your pull out with a little lock out to stop you from putting on the service lights without meaning to in combat zones. You have this lovely, uh, I, I call it Art Deco, make of it what you will, uh, gauge, fuel, temperature, oil pressure, and the electricity, ignition for the motor, starter switch, hand throttle, a choke. Yeah, yes, one of those old things. Speedometer, uh, a selector, which shows you, are you reading the left or the right fuel tank on the gauge? DC voltmeter, another vent, little panel lights, a small hooded light, and a glove compartment, which of course probably doesn't contain gloves. That's it, about the only remaining items are the three pedals at the bottom, clutch, brake, accelerator, a dimmer switch on the front, and the horn is front and center of the steering wheel. Now, because of the limited field of traverse of the gun, the driver, of course, will remain in his position with the engine running during combat. And he also is going to be ducking down and holding his ears, waiting instructions. Another function he has is the release of the travel lock once they've come to a position. Flip forward, down, rotate, and it's released. As for the startup process, the engine is actually a little bit warm, so you don't have to do everything. But once you have your fuel tank selector set, if it was cold, you can pull the choke out halfway, the throttle a quarter inch according to the manual. But in this case, we just verify that the transmission is in neutral. Press down on the clutch, 
Uh, it's not an electric interlock or anything, it's just a release strain on the system. Ignition to on, and then push the button. Not really very much to it. All right, let's take it for a go. No power steering. M3 was officially in service only some six months after conception, which is something of a record. About three score managed to make it to the Philippines in time to defend against the Japanese invasion there. They were again in service on day one of Operation Torch at the landings at Iran. Immediately they were tested in combat and the idea of whether or not an open-topped vehicle can master attacking tanks was tested in the first engagement of M3s versus Panzers. A single M3 destroyed four Panzer III's with four shots. Later, an M3 was the first American vehicle credited with a direct fire kill on a Tiger. But possibly their greatest moment came at El Guitar, one of the few occasions where tank destroyer units are actually used as doctrine intended, as battalion-sized organizations defending against an enemy massed armored attack. 26 M3's were destroyed with the loss of 14 men. They destroyed 37 enemy tanks over two-thirds of the total killed that day. Eventually, though, the time came for the M3s to go away. They were, after all, expedient vehicles. About 2,100 of them were built between February 42 and April 43, but by March 44, they were classified as limited standard and declared obsolete in August of 44, with instructions being put out to convert the M3s back to standard personnel carrying half-track. That's it. As ever, these are promotional videos for World of Tanks. If you want to show your support for these videos, feel free to register for the game using the link below, and you may also find an enjoyable way of spending your evenings. Hope you found it interesting and informative. Take care. Gone that could be reasonably fielded on a vehicle at the time. So, that said... Something. This video was released on a couple of weeks' time delay. If you wish to see other World of Tanks made videos sooner, keep an eye on the World of Tanks North America YouTube channel. Link is in the description below.